Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are previewing the Open Championship at Royal St. George's Golf Club with Brandon Gadula getting his thoughts on this year's field on the course and who he is betting for this week. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com, Ed. Euro 2020 in the final lived up to the hype uh, with Italy winning in penalties. Obviously, you feel bad for the way that it went down, but like from a a, a non like like I just feel bad for people a lot of time. If if I yeah. ignore that part of me, it was really thrilling the way that 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 match unfolded. Well, I'm glad you thought it was really thrilling. I mean, I actually thought the match was pretty boring. Um, <laughs> Which you said I going in. About, what's that? You said going in, it would be that way. Yeah. It was it was gonna be somewhat boring, so I'm, I'm glad you th- found it exciting. Obviously, the penalty shootout makes a hero and a goat really quick. So, um, yeah, and we really saw the Italian keeper just just yeah. all of a sudden appear. I think you know Italy hadn't allowed a lot of goals. The defense had been relatively good throughout the tournament, and then you forget that the Italians have this 22 year old keeper that has been the regular at Milan since he was 16. Yeah, like he, he's like, been starting since he's 16 years old. That's incredible. And that was a lot of the discussion around England and the penalties was the youth and the people who they chose to kick the penalties. But then you've got a 22 year old trying to stop them the whole time, and right. just the the youth across the board on that stage. I think regarding the excitement of the match, I think that stakes mattered a lot there. Like if it were a friendly and it were that way, I don't know if I would have deemed it as being exciting. But when you have those stakes and knowing how badly both these countries wanted to win, that does change things pretty dramatically from a a viewing perspective. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, the stakes are are certainly high. Um, And we did get the early goal, which certainly added to the excitement, although maybe not for England fans because they really went into their shell. And I think Bill Connolly tweeted they had three shots from minute two until minute 90 or something along those lines. And I think pretty sure a couple of those happened in the first 15 minutes. So, right. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was interesting in that how the match evolved was pretty interesting. And we'll, we'll talk about that in covering the past. Exactly. We'll do that in a bit here. As mentioned, Brandon Gadula is coming up for today to preview the open championship. You can find Brandon on Twitter at Gadula 13. Of course, he is the managing editor at numberfire.com. My co-host on the heat check fantasy podcast on the number fire daily fantasy podcast feed. So we talked DFS yesterday. You can find that uh, already posted. We're going to talk to Brandon about the open championship, his favorite outrights, favorite non outrights and more to get you set for Thursday. But first make sure you are subscribed to cover covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts. As we get into July, we are starting to get close to NFL and college football season. That is just around the corner. Always an exciting time. We can start to talk some player props in the not so distant future. So fun time to be talking betting here. Make sure you hit the subscribe button on Apple podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be here weekly until NFL season. And then, bi-weekly uh, once we get into football season with college football and the NFL back once again. Before we get to Brandon, though, we got to go back to last week. We had Edward Egras on to talk about the Euro 2020 final. Go back through that and talk about your good prediction, Ed, about how that game would unfold. Covering the past. So last week here, we had Edward Egros on to talk about the Euro 2020 final and the NBA finals as well. You can find Edward on Twitter at Edward Sports and check out the Odds and Eds podcast as well on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Ed was on England's money line in regulation at plus 155, obviously went to penalties. So uh, was the draw there that came through. But Ed, your bet in regulation did come through. You had under two and a half goals, which was minus 205. And that did happen because it was at two goals after the full plus stoppage time. So a hit for you on that one. And it sounds like based on the way you've been talking about it, it kind of played out the way as expected where there wasn't a high pace in this game. There was not a high pace. It was a very defensive game. And I actually want to talk a little bit about how modern analytics looks at this game. It looks at the game in terms of expected goals or XG. And XG is simply a way of 
quantifying how good a shot is. So you're going to get very little XG for a shot from 35 yards away. You're going to get a lot of XG for the Italian goal where the player was literally two yards uh, away from the goal. So when you look at this, you know, you know, Italy had 2.1 XG and England had 0.4 XG. And I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. Honestly, uh, XG isn't a perfect stat. And, you know, they assigned a lot of XG for the Italian goal, which we talked about. You know, Bonucci just got the ball two yards away from the goal and was able to tap it in. But there was kind of a couple of fortunate bounces. There was a header that kind of went off the post um, and just kind of landed at his feet. So probably a little bit of an exaggeration there. I, I don't think Italy had a lot of quality chances outside of that. And then on the England side, you know, there was that goal in the first minute where there was a cross over to the left back who hit it perfectly uh, right, in, right in the post and, and England goes up one nothing. That was also interesting to me, too, because Shaw had never scored a goal for England before. He's a oh, defensive wow. player. And that's a really tough ball to pick out of the air and just just hit without without getting a touch first. So I think that opportunity was a little bit, uh, you know, 0.3 XG on that one seems like a lot. So it was a really defensive game without a lot of opportunities. And, and I can see many worlds in which it's zero, zero heading into penalty kicks. So um, yeah, just a little, just some thoughts about how, you know, we look at the game in terms of XG and, and um, yeah, I feel pretty good about the way it did turn out from, from my analysis. And it sounds like you thought that England was, were they being tentative after the goal or what do you think was the, kind of the cause i guess from the lack of quality shots after they got that goal on the bank so england has played very defensive they have they've not had a scheme where they get their ball to their attacking players and that has been true throughout the tournament and then what they did for this game is they took away one of their attacking players and put in um another defensive player so they actually played kind of five guys at the back and then two very defensive oriented midfielders and so seven of your 10 guys are focused on defending. Whereas, you know, like, uh, I guess it would have been six of your guys were very focused on defending before. And that didn't really lead to much. So, so it was really kind of the, the scheme a little bit. And yeah, the, there just wasn't a lot of opportunities. And do you feel like that was a mistake? Or do you think that given the opponent in Italy, that's the way they should have played it with a, with a one nil lead? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's a mistake, but... <laughs> I'm also wearing a German <laughs> jersey too of a very attacking team. So I think it's a matter of preference, right? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of American football fans that hate LSU over Alabama 9-6 are going to want more attacking type soccer. And if you're an England fan, it's just frustrating because you do have a lot of attacking talent that either didn't get the ball much or was sitting on the bench. Yeah, and uh, we actually had one of those attackers talked about in other bets that Ed talked about last week. He looked in some fun markets, which is kind of Ed, Ed's thing. Uh, one of them was for Italy having the first booking, which is minus 114. He got that one. Uh, it was just after halftime. Nicola Barella got a yellow card, first one of the match. And so a win for Edward there. He had Harry Kane as an anytime goal scorer at plus 185. As you mentioned, didn't see a lot of Kane in that match. Uh, yeah. Luke Shaw was a lone goal for England there. Was Kane one of the guys specifically you were referring to there as being like, maybe we should have featured this guy a bit more? Oh, of course. I mean, he's yeah. one of the best goal scorers in the world and probably the best that England's ever had. Right. And nothing there. So I'm sure Edward a little salty about the way that one broke down. Uh, he was on England plus 146 for a clean sheet. And that actually was looking pretty good for a while. And honestly, like we we're talking about the approach. That's not bad for for Edward trying to get that clean sheet. You know, they get the one nil lead. They can go into that defensive type mindset you alluded to. And they did have a clean sheet until the 67th minute. So uh, that was close, but not quite there. Either way, a, a good week for you, Ed. And then uh, we got the winner on the first booking from Edward, of course. It's very fittingly that Edward uh, nailed that one for sure. My bet. And, and, not, go ahead. Uh, and also, we got to give props to John Sheeran and FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, they were very much on Italy's side. Yeah. To, to lift the cup at one point uh, they had england minus 110 italy plus 102 to lift the cup which was significantly different from uh where a lot of other sharp books were uh that's not where it closed i mean it definitely moved towards england but fanduel was always kind of leaning towards italy to lift the cup throughout <laughs> uh, John throughout the days leading up to that match 
uh, John, I believe, is Scottish, so I think that have <laughs> played well, out. You know, I, I, John, John would never let his uh, back. No, of course uh, not. The odds on FanDuel Sportsbook are. A- so. After the match, he did tweet, it's coming home, winky face. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I think John had an okay day on Sunday. Uh, I'm, I'm right. pretty firm in saying that. But hey, like you said, and they do. he did talk about how they have situations where they believe what their numbers say. And right. it's possible they just said Italy. So, uh, and it sounds like they trusted that for sure. But, but that really the depends number... on the court, though, sure. right? Sure, absolutely. Right. And I thought, and I I believe John had, had told me some point that, like, his group doesn't do soccer. Like, they have partners in okay. Europe that do that. Okay. Well, either way, I'm sure he was happy with the way things broke <laughs> on Sunday. My bet last week was NASCAR looking at William Byron at plus 1,400 to win in Atlanta. And the long shot I mentioned in passing did better than Byron, which is not a good thing. Uh, Tyler Reddick was 85 to 1 to win. Mentioned him in passing as there was value there. He had a fifth place average running position. He was awesome that entire race. Finished six, so didn't win. But like he ran well, and Byron did not. He was decent early on. Uh, he got stage points in the first stage. His third stage was hideous. He went a lap down. Uh, so he was not even close. And it seems like there was there were there was buzz that NASCAR had talked to Hendrick Motorsports about the nose on their cars before the Pocono races. Since then, we did see Alex Bowman win one of the races. They might have won, if not for fuel mileage, in the second race, but uh, but Kyle Busch won that one. And then Atlanta last week, Hendrick didn't seem as dominant. So I'm at least going to log that in the back of my mind that the Hendrick Motorsports cars may not be quite as potent as they had been previously. Of course, we didn't see Chase Elliott win two uh, in uh, at Road America, but it's at least in my brain that there is a potential for Hendrick to take a slight step backwards as a result of this nose change for them. And I'm keeping an eye on that in the next time they're a one half mile track. But either way, Byron did not work out. So apologies on that one. We'll run it back in the very near future with some NASCAR. But they've got a two week uh, off schedule here with the Olympics. So we'll get back on some NASCAR after the break. I'm talking golf for today. Speaking of golf, we'll talk about that here in just a second with Brandon Gadula. You can find him on Twitter at Gadula13. He is, of course, the managing editor at numberfire.com, the co host of the Heat Check Fantasy podcast with myself. Talk in DFS. We're going to preview the Open Championship. We get Brandon's thoughts on both his favorite outrights and non-outrights. But first, the 2021 NBA Finals are here, and FanDuel and Taco Bell are teaming up to add an extra layer of excitement to the action. Introducing the FanDuel Sportsbook and Taco Bell NBA Finals comeback bonus. The terms are simple. All you have to do is head to FanDuel Sportsbook before tip-off and place a $25-plus pre-live money line bet on either team to win. If the team you bet on overcomes a halftime deficit to win, you will be eligible to receive a $10 bonus in FanDuel site credit. You'll win your first bet and earn a bonus as well. Now, that's more ways to win thanks to our friends at Taco Bell. Users must opt in to the promo code in order to be eligible for the bonus payout. Eligible every NBA final scheme until the bonus hits. Must be 21 plus and present in Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. Bonus issued as a non-withdrawable site credit that expires in seven days. Max bonus $10. Restrictions apply. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Colorado, 1-800-522-4700. In Iowa, 100 bets off. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line, 1-800-889-9789. Or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Covering the present. Let's bring Brandon Gadula back into covering the spread to talk about the Open Championship teeing off on Thursday over at Royal St. George's Golf Club. Brandon, it is the final major of this super major season. How are you doing today? Good. I'm always a little a little sad whenever it's the final major just because it feels like uh, so long, so long uh, till the next one. We got a little bit spoiled, and, and I guess in a way we didn't really get spoiled yeah. last year, but coming with the, the November Masters, so we got five of them uh, in, in a jam-packed window. But, you know, I mean, this is going to be a really tough event uh, scoring-wise, and that's always some of my favorite golf. So I'm, I'm pretty excited for this one. So you're lamenting this is the last major. Does that mean that you don't get up for the, the FedEx Cup playoffs that doesn't quite draw you in as much? Shocker? Uh, not quite, especially mm-hmm. because it's just 
still impossible to figure out who's in contention and they're always showing like projected standings and I don't know where guys actually are. And, you know, these guys skip tournaments, but they're still relevant. I don't know. I, I, I want there to be some like added emphasis on the FedEx cup and the, I know the PGA tour does, but mm-hmm. uh, it just doesn't really transfer over. 10 mil seems like they're trying pretty hard to get people to try and care about that. Now I got to ask you uh, stylistically for you, for the open, are you someone who will wake up to watch like the opening tees or are you wake up, check results and, and watch what you can after you're awake? Um, I mean, I kind of split that. It's not like I sleep in. I, I do try to wake up early, although uh, surprisingly, we're going to have some some company spend the night. So they're going to have to deal with me getting up and super early. You have people uh, you have friends coming over. This is this is very anti Brandon. I'm I'm shocked by this. So, yes, my wife's uh, she choreographed a musical uh, and her friends coming from out of town to see it and they're spending the night. Okay, so clearly Brandon is the inferior half of uh, of the partnership in the <laughs> Gadula household, for sure. Oh, yeah. We knew that. We, we knew that one. Yeah, just confirmation of what we knew to be true previously. So let's talk to Brandon. Since we've got him here, we'll settle for Brandon and talk to him about the Open Championship for this week at Royal St. George's Golf Club. And it's a spot that they have not been to since 2011 because, of course, the Open does rotate. But we do have data from 2011, at least, not shot length data. We do have some data. What can we learn from the event with regards to what types of golfers should perform best this week? Yeah, I mean, so anytime you're breaking down an event, one of the first things I try to do is figure out the driving stats and which ones matter. Is it distance? Is it accuracy? Is it is it both or is it is it kind of neither sometimes uh, where there's like not really a big emphasis either way, but uh, for driving this week, based on what we saw in 2011, uh, just kind of looking to drive it well enough to remain in contention or basically not have your driver put you out of contention uh, is a big key this week. By far, driving distance correlated stronger with stroke differential than fairways hit uh, back in 2011. Good drive rate actually doubled distance alone in terms of that correlation with stroke differential. And a good drive, uh, you know, it's a, probably a little bit misleading. There's probably mo- actually more overlap with stroke skiing off the tee than either just distance or accuracy. But a good drive is either a fairway hit or if you miss a green regulation or you miss a fairway, you, then you hit the green regulation. So it does factor in some some iron play there. But, um, you know, as far as like the other uh stats off the tee box when we look back at 2011 we saw that scrambling correlated strongest with stroke differential followed closely by greens and regulation again as you mentioned no shot link data so no strokes gained data uh, i would just caution against scrambling itself because that's just getting up and down it's still considers par conversions uh, with, with the putter. So, you know, as always, though, uh, n- you can look at anything you want uh, with a major, but you need golfers who just do everything well. So for me, I'm looking at uh, strokes gain approach, number one, uh, which is always the case, but strokes gained off the tee, strokes gain approach, and strokes gain putting uh, all weighted a bit differently, but you, you got to have all four facets uh, this week. And specifically at Royal St. George's, I think it's going to be a little bit uh, extra interesting because – the average winning score across Open Championships since 1980 is nine under par, but at the ones we've had at Royal St. George's, it's uh, 4.2 under on average, which makes it the second toughest venue in that span. So uh, even going to play tougher uh, this week. So you got to have your golfers just be able to do everything. We saw that in 2011. <laughs> We're going to see it again uh, in 2021. So, Brandon, uh I'm a little embarrassed to show my ignorance, uh, but you guys were talking about scrambling yesterday on the DFS podcast too. Uh, what does that What does that mean? So scrambling is basically uh, when you the, the easiest way to think about it is when you miss a green regulation, uh, but you chip and putt and save par. So basically, uh, saving par whenever you aren't on pace to make par, and a green regulation is uh, getting to a green with a, a two putt being par. Right. So hitting a green regulation on a par three would just be, you know, putting your tee shot on the green and then you can two putt for par. So if you miss uh, the the green and then you chip and save par. So that's the kind of stuff that we're going to, that we're going to need this week. But speaking to that specifically, yeah, that's, that's important. But if you look at just overall scrambling stats from the PGA tour, you're going to see, it's going to be a bit trickier uh, than looking at strokes gained around the green, which will show you how close you get to the pin. 
Uh, and scrambling also, you know, you could be a great wedge player and just miss your putts, which obviously you need to make your putts. But mm. scrambling is just the percentage of times that you save par. Strokes gain around the green and strokes gain putting is going to be a little bit more indicative of the stats that we're actually looking for. So, but we don't have those stats from 2011. Uh, for you know, we don't have shot link for that that open. So, kind of imputing what we need would be strokes gained around the green and strokes gained putting combined to make up that scrambling. Scrambling also can just be it's not necessarily just wedge playing around the green too. So scrambling uh, a little bit outdated at this point. Ed, are you going to be a DFS grinder that with with us this week? No, I'm just playing somebody. <laughs> but I wanted I wanted some insight, so I listened to a good chunk of your your podcast yesterday. Maybe we can talk you into a, a lineup or two. You know, mm. we'll, we'll see. We'll work <laughs> on it. That's our goal for the rest of this podcast: is convince Ed to play some DFS for this week. Now, Brandon, we just talk about course history, and generally, when we talk about it, we talk about how it can be overvalued in betting markets and other stuff, and discussion around these things. With this event, we can't look at it because obviously they have not been to Royal St. George's since 2011. So are you using anything here as a proxy? Are you looking at what they've done in previous Open Championships, past majors, links, courses? What are you looking at here, if anything, as a proxy for course history? Yeah, so it's always tricky with the Open. Uh, I do use these as like tiebreakers, specifically in this instance, Open history and major history, just because that speaks to the strength of the field uh, and those expectations, the pressure of playing in majors. Um, but I don't like to look too much at Lynx courses or even European tour stats, because not every course they play is, is Lynxy. And to get a solid sample for Lynx courses, you need to dig back pretty far, and that's not necessarily the, the best route. Um, now, I will say we have kind of a similar situation with the PGA Championship from this year because we had the PGA Championship at Kiowa Island uh, this this year, but also in 2012 when we have the Open uh, at the same course as it was in 2011. So, you know, an extra year there. But, you know, Rory won the PGA back in 2012 by eight and he finished 49th this year. And uh, of the 40 golfers who played both of those PGAs, only Justin Rose finished top 15 both years. Three others top 25 in each year, but you don't want to be looking at like 2011 specifically. But then that also kind of brings in complications of they're not playing the same courses uh, for the Open. So I kind of just cut, you know, to a, a very small degree, uh, weight in past performances at Opens, past performances uh, at Majors. I want to see good Open form, but it's not a must, similar to kind of like to what we see with Augusta. Um, and I have plenty of interest in Colin Morikawa, Victor Hovland, and Scotty Scheffler, despite their combined zero Open Championship starts between them. So, Brandon, uh, John Rahm is, is the favorite. Uh, he used to be our well-kept data-driven secret, but yeah. uh, <laughs> John Rahm won a major, so he won a major, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. U.S. Open. So, uh, so now he's becoming the favorite places. Uh, so are, is there any value still in Rom, or, or what are we thinking in terms of betting him to win or top five or whatnot? Yeah. So with Rom, uh, he's plus 750 uh, to win on FanDuel Sportsbook, which is pretty wild for a field this full uh, and a major. Uh, I do not see like I see no value. Uh, my model sees no value in betting Rom, but I do understand the interest, even at such short, short odds, because Rom, you know, won the U.S. Open. Uh, but it's not just that, really. He was eighth at the PGA, uh, withdrew from Memorial when he led by six and had to withdraw due to that positive COVID nineteen test, and then went on to win the U.S. Open, uh, and then. Last week at the Scottish Open, he finished seventh whenever he led the field in strokes gained tee to green, averaging uh, 0.65 more strokes tee to green per round than the next best mark in the field. He just happened to lose 0.45 strokes putting, and he is a phenomenal putter. So it's not that big of a stretch to say that John Rom could have been entering this with three straight wins. So I understand the appeal. I understand why the odds are so low, but... My model gives John Rahm an 8% chance to win. Uh, he would need to be up close to almost 12% uh, based on those odds. So I'm out on Rom, but assuming the model is close to correct, that is actually going to lead. Th so the, the, that big discrepancy is going to lead to some value elsewhere down the board. Well, that's what I was going to ask, because like for me with NASCAR, when Kyle Larson is 30% implied versus 21% in my Sims, mm -hmm. it, it's hard for me to like, I have a tough time with that. Cause I'm like, okay, 
are my Sims undervaluing him? Right. And so I can't tell, is the value elsewhere good? For you with ROM, do you feel confident in your model properly val- valuing him? Or are you nervous that you may be undervaluing him, which may look the, may make the value elsewhere seem a bit uh, fool's goldy? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's super, it's super difficult to know. Uh, hot streaks in golf are real. Uh, you can see clear trends, but they don't last forever. Uh, this is something I mentioned on the podcast yesterday when we were talking about the DFS uh, angle here. Uh, but with ROM, uh, Data Golf has a, a their adjusted stroke gains, and over the past twenty rounds, he's like almost a full stroke per round better than the next best golfer in the field. Which is like, if I used that as his baseline, he would be, you know, I would assume well over uh, expectation. But twenty rounds is not a large enough sample uh to trust so i use the past year and wait it for field strength obviously but for recency as well so i mean the super recent form and honestly for rom and and again i don't like to look just at finishes but if you just look at his finishes it's like all top tens lately uh he's just that good he's that and he does everything well so there is a chance that i'm undervaluing him because i'm not giving him so much credit for the hot streak but that is factored in to a degree and it's still not really showing enough value to go to ROM at plus 750. So let's say you're not betting ROM, which you said you're not. Uh, you said there may be value elsewhere. Do you see any value towards the top of the odds board for this week? So this won't surprise anyone who knows anything about me, but Xander Schauffele at, at plus 1800 does outperform his win odds in my model. Uh, he's at 5.5% likely to win, uh, making him the second most likely golfer to win behind ROM at 8%, uh, which is kind of what I see all the time whenever they're both in the Mm -hmm. field, because they're both just so good statistically and so consistent. And, you know, we don't think of Xander anymore as someone who just goes out and wins because he hasn't won in quite some time. But uh, according to my database, which adjusts for field strength and recency, again, uh, Xander's the only golfer in this field to be in the 85th percentile or better. in all four of those adjusted strokes gain categories over the past year, uh, it's really like Xander is just such an outlier. He does everything well. We won an all around golfer this week. So Xander, and especially at major six top fives and 17 starts, 15 made cuts. Both of those misses coming at the PGA. It's about as high floor as we can get. And honestly, <clears throat> the fact that he hasn't won is not really going to affect me, but uh, so I'm in on Xander. Uh, I like Patrick Cantley as well. Uh, he's like almost Xander light with the, the, the balanced and really high, uh, ranks across those strokes gain ca- uh, categories. He's plus 3,300. He's finished 12th and 41st in his two open championship starts. And I was going to leave it at those two, uh, but Dustin Johnson is now plus 2,500, which is super appealing. Uh, that's exactly where my model has him. Again, I use it a year of data to simulate things. So that explains things to a degree, but that does weight in recent rounds more. And even with that, like, I mean, DJ is actually back up to the world number one. So uh, just kind of a, a fluky thing there. But, you know, we're getting the world number one with the upside of being just showing up and looking like possibly the best golfer of all time at his peak at, you know, 25 to one, which is really appealing. So those are kind of three names that I'm I'm honing in on uh, at the very top. But also I can throw in Patrick Reed, Victor Hovland, Colin Morikawa between 30 and 35, all drawing my attention. If you had to pick one between Xander Cantley and DJ at, at where he's at, would it be Xander is the one with the biggest edge for you, or do you want DJ or Cantley there? Um, so the biggest edge would belong uh, to actually, I, yeah, Xander right now because I haven't looked uh, since DJ's odds drop, but Xander by by a tinge. Okay, so Xander at eighteen to one, uh, number one for Brandon for this week, and obviously. That's at the top of the odds board, but it can yeah. get a little bit weird in the open. And we've seen some, you know, some Shane Lowry type performances here before. Is there anybody you've got your eye on there as being a potential surprise performer, whether it be a long shot outright? Those are tough to bet, at least for me. Uh, but yeah. like someone who may be undervalued in the overall betting markets in general. Uh, well, if I can count Tony Finau at that counts? Uh, plus 5,000 as a long shot, then Tony Finau. Uh, could be just a, a classic uh, overreaction. He's missed two straight cuts, and those did come from poor ball striking performances. But Finau ranks in the 92nd percentile in adjusted strokes gained to degree in my database over the past year. We know he's like a big time performer uh, in majors, and 
did miss that cut at the U.S. Open, but has 12 top 20 finishes in his past 21 majors. He showed up well at the British Open, uh, 18th, 27th, 9th, and 3rd. Again, if you trust a long-term sample for Finau, he's better uh, than that You know, 50-1 to 1 number implies. Uh, but if that's not long enough for you, I think Lucas Herbert would be appealing. His odds are actually up to 75, or I guess down to 75 to one. He was like in the 150 to 200 range, but he's coming in uh, with a win and a T4 on the European tour, but was also top 20 and two PGA tour stars right before that. So, uh, I mean, if you look at him statistically, really good short game, but the irons and, and driver are are there uh, well enough. Uh, and then I don't know if you want me to throw in like the other top tens I'm considering here. Um, sure. But that would be uh, Harris English. Oh, these, these are top tens, top twenties. The longer guys are more top twenties because I'm trying to be smarter and, and not chase all the outrights as Jim, Jim alluded to, but <laughs> Harris English is undervalued. Uh, Cameron Tringali as I'm sure Jim uh, would, would love uh, to hear Taylor Gooch, Corey Connors, Brian Harmon and Charlie Hoffman all look undervalued for me. So those are the kinds of guys who I'm, hoping to hit on maybe a top 10 or top 20 to, to balance out the bankroll uh, this week. So Brandon, there's, there's a lot of VIG in these uh, uh, markets for the winner and even top 20 and stuff like that. Uh, are there other markets that you might suggest maybe some head to heads that, that you're looking at uh, heading into this golf tournament? Yeah. So I, I went through some head to heads. I kind of, Struggled with the head-to-head specifically, but I did pinpoint two I like. Victor Hovland, minus 102 over uh, Louis Westazen. Uh, Louis in really good form coming off of multiple uh, runner-up finishes. Uh, but Hovland, just a, a, an elite tee to green golfer. Uh, the, the the wedges are working their way back up. So I like Hovland uh, at that number. And also Tiro Hatton, minus 112 over the defending champ Shane Lowry. Shane Lowry, uh, I think, is a little bit overinflated because of the win. Uh, but Tiro Hatton was almost, you know, there there have been times where it just felt like Tiro Hatton's unfadeable. Uh, but I, I like him long term over Lowry. And then I did find uh, three group bets that looked pretty good to me. Group E, uh, Patrick Reed at plus 220 over the group of Scotty Scheffler, Lee Westwood and Tommy Fleetwood. Uh, Reed came out at plus 160 for me in that matchup. Scheffler is also a value there, but that really stems from uh, Westwood and Fleetwood just being overvalued and both being in that group. Uh, group G, Tony Finau, someone I already talked about, plus 250 over Robert McIntyre, who's getting a lot of buzz, Mark Leishman and Sergio Garcia. But uh, McIntyre, Leishman, and Garcia are uh, all kind of overhyped uh, just because of various things. But, you know, and Finau is getting like that discredit. So I like Finau at plus 250 in Group G. And then the final one, Group F, Abraham Answer at plus 220 over some, again, overrated, overvalued veterans at this point, Justin Rose, Ricky Fowler, and Adam Scott. Uh, so Answer should really contend. Uh, he's a really good uh, golfer, just doesn't necessarily have the driver to contend most places, but he can uh, get to the greens. He can he can get up and down. He can scramble. He can putt. So I like Abraham Answer quite a bit uh, at plus 220 for Group F. Well, I'm glad to hear this Finau propaganda, and I can guarantee you it will not end because I'll be talking about him in just a bit as well. That is Brandon Gadula. You can find him on Twitter at Gadula13. Also check out his win simulations, which are posted over at numberfire.com. We also have our DFS podcast, the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast. We're talking about the Open Championship, everything else over at Number Fire. Brandon, we appreciate the time. Good luck with your bets. Good luck with your DFS lineups outside of the one against me. And we'll talk to you again, hopefully in the very near future. Yeah, it was great. It's always great talking, uh, you know, in detail about uh, the, the model and it always, just always great to talk about golf with you guys. Absolutely. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks, Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Brandon Gadula for swinging by and breaking down the Open Championship. And Ed, uh, as you mentioned, John Rahm went from being the guy that all the betting world was talking about to being Kind of a buzzkill now with his odds being so short. It was the same thing again with Kyle Larson this year, where I was like, oh man, I can keep betting Kyle Larson all of a sudden. No, 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 I can't anymore. Yeah. They've they've taken this away. And it's just it's sad to lose our our kind of golden our golden boy uh for betting here. Yeah, I was watching the PGA with some friends and I was talking about John Rahm, and they were like, What really? He's one of the world's best golfers. Yeah. <laughs> and there was value then. And, and then I think a good, very, very good golfer got hot and that takes away all the value. So a little bit sad to see, but you know, 
Brandon Stoke talked about Xander Schauffele, and so hopefully there's some value and we can hit on that before uh, he gets hot and uh, there's no more value with him. What I was going to say is you're not you're not someone who deserves to be a prohibitive favorite until you until you are. And so that's why I am okay continuing to go back to people like Xander Schauffele, despite the fact that he hasn't gotten the job done yet, because like once he proves that the value is going to be totally gone. So I'm okay continuing to turn yeah. towards guys like him and like Fino as well, who I'll talk about a bit, uh, despite the fact they have not gotten the job done because the elements for getting it done are there. And those elements are what matter. And those elements are what allow us to predict when they will do it. And then suddenly become, you know, no more, no more value to us. But I think that, uh, the elements of Rom are there with Xander as well. So we'll see if you can pull things off this week over at Royal St. George's. Let's move now into covering the future. And Ed, you want to talk some NBA finals. We saw the Bucks get things to two to one in game number three. Uh, Phoenix still minus 270 to win this series at FanDuel Sportsbook. What are you seeing with the series and with game number four? Yeah, I haven't really been following closely. So um, this is kind of going to be more trying to catch up with, with what's going on, but I, but I think I do have some insights. So if you kind of look at the spreads starting game one, Phoenix was a five point favorite. Remember that was probably, that was Giannis's first game back. So there was probably some question marks as to how he would play. Uh, Phoenix wins that game. They moved to a four and a half point favorite in game two. Milwaukee was a four and a half point favorite in game three at home. So a pretty big spread. And then currently they're sitting at minus four at FanDuel Sportsbook for game four on Wednesday night. With the finals, they're allowing almost full capacity in these stadiums. So I had talked previously about with reduced capacity, that home court advantage of the playoffs should be about three points. Clearly with the spread uh, of how it's flopping back and forth between Phoenix and Milwaukee, it looks like that home court advantage is more like four and a half points which makes sense for full stadiums. And um, yeah, I, th- I think that does make sense. A four and a half was what I was using before a couple of years ago when I used to do these types of calculations. And, you know, we're, we're at a point in the United States where we are getting the full capacity. So we're really talking about a pretty even matchup between uh, Phoenix and Milwaukee. And you probably, you know, when you look at these spreads, I, w- I would probably say Phoenix on a neutral court would be about a half point better than Milwaukee and if that's true that leads to about a 72 percent probability to win the series um so it's really close um if I can understand with how close the series is you might think that's too much in favor of the Suns so if you think Milwaukee is the better team maybe they're a half point better the that leads to about a 33 34 percent series win probability for Milwaukee And so you can kind of look at these markets, right? And say like, well, if I like Phoenix and I really do think they're the better team, then maybe I want to go bet Phoenix plus four and a half over at at DraftKings, which I think would have some value at this point because the home court is probably not five. If you're leaning on the side that Milwaukee is the better team, even if by a half point, maybe a point, um, most of these books have the series price of Milwaukee plus 200. So about a 33% implied probability. If you like Milwaukee better than a half point, over Phoenix for the rest of the series, that looks like a pretty good bet. So it's a way to look at related markets uh, with the new home court that we're using now because these stadiums are more full. And um, uh, you can just look at it. You know, Ed Miller in his book talks about no hold markets. And and so you can look at these related markets and find a no hold price. And I'm certainly not here to tell you which one of those is true, whether Phoenix or Milwaukee is the better team. I honestly have no idea, but I do have a way of translating uh, spreads into series prices. And um, that's what my analysis shows. And that was a lot of what I talked about when we had him on the show. He was talking about how you want to find situations in which you could hypothetically bet both sides and be like smart about it. And you want to find situations where the required knowledge is decrease like we all think we're very knowledgeable but you want to find situations where that knowledge is requisite knowledge is not as high and yeah. here you're making one decision and it's informing which way you want to go in in betting this this series slash game four yeah exactly so yeah you know i mean if you think milwaukee is the better team by a point their series price win probability should be about 36 percent, right and, and so that would be value and you know i mean one point and a half is not that much different no definitely not 
Okay, so I like that. We're looking for ways to make things easier on ourselves. We're talking about betting top 10 and top 20 markets in golf. You know, a lot of those are pretty juiced up. So if we can find ways to reduce that, uh, give ourselves advantages over the sports books, we should do so. So Ed is talking about checking out Phoenix versus Milwaukee and what you see in that series, how you view them relative on a neutral court and going from there based on that. So Phoenix plus four and a half for game four or Milwaukee plus 200, depending on how you see things playing out there. For my cover in the future, I want to talk about Tony Finau. As alluded to previously, the market for him to me is plus 210. To finish inside the top 20, Finau is entering here, as Brandon mentioned, with back-to-back missed cuts. And those missed cuts came in part due to poor ball striking, which is concerning. But the larger sample on Finau says he is a tremendous ball striker, both off the tee and approach, and I trust the larger sample. So I want to bet Finau plus 210 to get a top 20 at the Open this week. Even when you include those two bad events, Finau still ranks 24th in the field and strokes in off the tee and 27th in approach over the past 50 rounds, according to Fantasy National. He ranks 7th around the green, so... He checks that box, which is something we talk about with with Rom, Xander, Cantlay, guys who are good in all three of the key facets outside of putting. The putter is different. In general, Finau is not a good putter, but his best surface is Bankgrass, which is the surface at Royal St. George's. He ranks 58th in Bankgrass putting over the past 100 rounds. So that means that the putting will be less of a concern here than it is in a lot of other places. If you look at the past six months, Finau ranks 22nd in Data Golf's True Strokes Gained metric, which is something Brandon was talking about. That accounts for field strength, but it also accounts for his rough two events and his issues on the greens. Those are baked into that number. He ranks 22nd there, and that's encouraging for me for a top 20 bet. One of the missed cuts for Finau came at the U.S. Open. He lost 2.5 strokes there, so it was rough, and that was in a tough field. So that could be a concern for Finau this week. But he was 8th in the PGA Championship. He was 10th at the Masters. As Brandon mentioned, he's played 21 uh, majors from 2015 on. And Finau has finished top 20 in 12 out of those 21, which is a 57% clip. His implied odds here are 32%. That includes three top 20 finishes in four shots at the Open Championship. He's been top 10 in each of the past two. So he can he can handle a link style course where the greens are just massive. That's okay for Tony Finau because the ball striking is generally so good. I don't think we should let two bad events push us off what appears to be a really good value on Finau at plus 210 to finish inside the top 20. So I think to me, that's the proper market here for Tony Finau. You could go with with the outright. Brandon did allude to that as being a, a long shot he likes. But to me, I think given you know the narrative around Finau and not being able to finish, it's not about that for me. It's more so about I want more leeway if the putter is not hot. For Finau, I want that leeway, and I think that a top 20 bet gives me that leeway. So Tony Finau, plus 210, is where I want to turn for this week to finish inside the top 20 at the Open Championship. Ed, you've heard Brandon talk. Uh, we've talked about some Tony Finau. What are you thinking for your betting card this week at the Open Championship? You got some good thoughts uh, ruminating over there? Yeah, I, I, I haven't made any bets yet, so I don't quite want to talk about them. But I, I, 90% that'll be in my newsletter this week. But, okay. uh, yeah, T- Tony Fina is interesting to me because, uh, Joe Pita is an analyst, uh, data guy that wrote a preview of the masters in 2019 and he had Fina as his favorite to, to win. And Fina made the final group on the last day, didn't end up winning because winning golf tournaments is hard. <laughs> but my understanding is that Fina's kind of dropped off a little bit in the intervening time, but is still just a really good, fantastic golfer all around. So um, I don't know. Maybe I'll be looking into the Tony Fina for for my bet this week. I, I'm I'm not quite sure yet. So since that Masters, he has been to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine majors. He has one, two, three, four, five top tens. So Jeez. he's not like a he's not towards the top of the odds board. Which I think he was he wasn't the favorite, obviously entering Augusta. Because I think that was that his debut year where he. Broke his ankle, basically. No, that's 2018. I believe it was his first. And 2017 yeah. was his first Masters. Um, or 2018 was his first Masters. And he finished top 10 there after he like dislocated his ankle the day before. Um, he's not quite on that same level necessarily, but he's still, you know, a top 20 golfer worldwide. I think that we can right. get that for plus 210 to finish top 20. I'll take that. So 
We'll see if Tony Finau can crack the email newsletter this week over at thepowerrank.com. Ed, what is what else is going on for you this week over there? Um, yeah, so most of that newsletter, sign up at thepowerrank.com. Probably golf this week. I, I want to promise golf, but you never know what happens between now and tomorrow morning when I'll end up writing it. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, we'll be getting into football soon. So there'll be a lot of uh, – the emails will almost exclusively be American football pretty soon uh definitely when we get to august um and then on the football analytics show i had brendan kent on he is the host of the measurables pod does a lot of he actually works at DraftKings, uh but we talk more about his work in sports analytics and education for sports analytics and he had a really fascinating story about how he got a job with the portland timbers as an undergrad so really good episode there check that out over at the football analytics show Perfect. And find Ed's new letter, newsletter at thepowerrank.com. Check out Ed on Twitter at thepowerrank. Big thank you once again to Brandon Gadula for swinging by and breaking down the Open Championship. You can find Brandon on Twitter at Gadula13 and check out his win simulations and his betting uh, work over at numberfire.com. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Good luck with your bets, whether it be for Game 4 of the NBA Finals or for the Open Championship. And we'll talk to you once again next week. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Aaron Dolan here. Thanks for watching and make sure you click below on that subscribe button for more great FanDuel content and check out some of our latest uploads and playlists right over here.